everyone. Good morning. I'm going to call our meeting to order. This is another joint meeting of the Children's Senior Families Committee for the County and the City of San Jose's Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee and Committee of the Whole on Gender-Based Violence and sexual, Child Sexual Abuse Prevention and Services. I really want to thank all of you for being here. Um, our first item on the agenda is our roll call. I'd like to start with the county clerk and ask you to take roll for the Children's Family Seniors Committee. Good morning, Vice Chairperson Ellenberg. You're muted. Apologies, I'm here. Thank you, and Chairperson Chavez. Here. Thank you, you have a quorum. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Council Member Perales, who is the Chair of the Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee. I know you call it PIS PIS, but I just wanted to Get the whole name out there. All right. Thank you, thank you, Supervisor. Um, I won't repeat it. You've said it. Uh, so uh, I'll ask our clerk if you can call uh, the roll for our committee. Perales. Here. Jimenez. Mahan. Here. Jones. Present. And Adenas. Here. Thank you. Thank you. We have a quorum as well. Uh, excellent. And then I'm going to just um, ask, as I call the names of those of you on the dais who've joined us today, um, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves. And I'll begin with Ken, ba uh, Ken Bender. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, Ken Bender here on behalf of Sheriff Lori Smith for the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office. Thank you. Adriana Caldera. Hi, Adriana Caldera, CEO, YWCA Golden Gate Silicon Valley. Carla Collins. Good morning, I'm Carla Collins and I oversee the Santa Clara County Office of Gender-Based Violence Prevention. Thank you, Chief Garnett. Hi, good morning everyone, nice to see you. I'm Laura Garnett and I'm the Chief Probation Officer. Paul Lorenz. Good morning, Paul Lorenz, CEO of Valley Medical Center. Um, Chief Mata. Good morning. Uh, Tony Mata, Chief of Police at San Jose. Chief Nikolai. Hi, Pat Nikolai from the Santa Clara Police Department, but I'm also the uh, Vice President of the Santa Clara County Police Chiefs Association. Welcome. Aaron O'Brien. Don't see Aaron. Molly O'Neill. DA Rosen. Good morning, I'm Jeff Rosen, the District Attorney. Renee Santiago. Yes, good morning. Uh, Renee Santiago, Director for the County of Santa Clara Health System. Great, thank you. And um, uh, Lee? Lee Wilcox, Assistant City Manager for the City of San Jose. Excellent. And did, was there any other invitees to the dais that I didn't introduce? I know some of you are gonna be presenting a little later, so anybody I missed? All right, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, first, let me let me get us uh, started. I'll just explain a little bit about how this is going to work today. Um, we're going to just for those of you who have joined us, we're going to be uh, beginning with item on our agenda item two, and we're going to go through item two, um, and that's going to be two A, two B, and two C, and we'll then take public comment on all of the items uh, together. And then what we're gonna do is we'll have public comment for items that are not on the agenda, but within the purview of the committee as item three. Uh, so, um, and then just to also warn everyone that this is a really packed agenda. So item 2C um, that Carla and Julie would really like to present to us, we'll present if we can fit it into that uh, time frame. I know I have most of you from 10 to noon. And um, I talked to our presenters, I know my staff has, to make sure that the presentations are tight enough that it gives opportunity for robust discussion from the committee and then um, for us to be able to take action at the end of the meeting. That's what our objective is. So if um, you would, if you're interested in a public comment, there will be public comment will be item three, but if you're interested in public comment on these agenda items, we'll take them after the presentation of 2A and 2B prior to 2C. All right, Does that makes sense to everyone. All right, that's a good way to go. All right, excellent. So we're gonna begin um, with item uh, 2A. And again, I just wanna 
remind everyone that this is a continuation of a series of joint meetings we've held on gender-based violence and child sex sexual abuse. And I really want to acknowledge uh, Council Member Arenas and her partnership in moving these um, agenda items forward. Um, we held a gender-based violence child abuse meeting um, on April 15th in 2019, November 20th in 2019, and April 29th in 2021. So we're going to receive three presentations today. Uh, one, removing barriers to accessing sexual assault forensic exams. Two, reporting of child sexual abuse. And three, the county's future comprehensive RFP relating to the gender-based violence prevention. In terms, in terms of our um, meeting today, I, I am going to say that we're going to hear from all of our presenters. Depending on time, I may stop us at after 2B. Um, and then the, the dais will have an opportunity to engage with the panelists. If I could ask that after presentation 2B, we will take public comment. Um, so council member Perales, I just wanna make sure that works for you and your the city team. Yes, yeah, that does, thank you. Excellent. So our first panel presentation today is from the office of the district attorney, Valley Medical Center, San Jose Police Department, the YW, and the YWCA relating to the sexual assault forensic exams. I'm just gonna let my colleagues know that for this uh, presentation, we anticipate it to be about 15 minutes. Then we'll turn to all of you for questions. So we'll let all the presenters present and then we'll turn to all of you for feedback and questions. All right. So I'm, I think I'm, Terry, I'm starting this off yes. with you. Welcome. Thank you. Let me share the screen here. Can everybody see that? No, not yet. Let's see, Terry, this is Maya with Cindy's office. I'm happy to try to share it if you're having problems. Well, let's oh, there. see. Perfect. Are we here? Everybody yes. can see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. The four of us, the director of Santa Clara County Adult Safe, Kim Walker, YWCA director of support services, Lindsay Manfield, San Jose PD, crime and intelligence analyst, Angeli Montessa, and myself, assistant DA Terry Harmon are pleased to be here. Thank you for holding this hearing and for, and for always making sexual assault a priority. In the aftermath of a sexual assault, the importance of a medical forensic care looms large, not just for the survivor's well-being, uh, but also for the police investigation. As an opening philosophy, I'm pleased to point out that the law supports what most, if not all of us believe, that a survivor who wants a sexual assault forensic exam is safe, gets one free of charge, and that it doesn't matter whether the survivor is cooperating with law enforcement. In looking at safes, the bigger umbrella comes from the state. Cal OES has a protocol for the examination and treatment of sexual assault victims and the collection and preservation of evidence. The forms that are used during an exam, the forms filled out by medical personnel to note observations and injuries, those are all standard forms issued by Cal OES. We also have a local protocol. The Santa Clara County SART Committee provides a seat at the table for all of our partners, law enforcement agencies, crime lab, victim advocates, uh, prosecutors, uh, women's of office policy, CBOs. And the, <clears throat> the important thing to remember about our SART Committee is that every organization that comes to the table deals with sexual assault and has different obligations. For example, the San Jose Police Department's sexual 
SALT unit is made up of a determined group of investigators. They want rapists and child molesters arrested and in jail, and we like that. We like that very, very much. VMC's responsibility is the patient. On a scale of one to 10, Kim Walker's focus on the patient is about a 15. She's uh, diligent about her medical and ethical responsibilities. And similarly, our confidential victim advocates like Lindsay Mansfield take their responsibilities seriously. So on the one hand, the fact that there are highly competent, motivated, and dedicated people in each silo should make for smooth sailing. But the reality is that the crossing and mixing of these service lines can create tension, misunderstandings, and disagreements, and some things can be worked out over the phone, and others cannot. And the SART, pro the SART committee is a place to air grievances and work towards a solution or at the very minimum, come to an understanding that appreciates the different roles and obligations each agency has. In short, the SART committee and the protocol is geared at being a bridge across the silos. Now, a separate agreement aimed at internal workflow issues and timeline expectations was recently reached with, as it relates to the Children's Advocacy Center. The working definition for the two types of acute sexual assault forensic exams qualified by law enforcement entailed a period within 72 hours for a child 11 and younger and within 10 days of last sexual contact for a child aged 12 to 17. The acute safes are indicated to collect and secure perishable evidence during the time it is available to treat injuries and other kinds of urgent treatment. Recently, SJPD the CAC and the medical team met to discuss the safe process for pediatric and adolescent safes. SJPD recommended to extend the acute time for pediatric safes from 72 hours to 10 days and to provide all children zero to 17 who are interviewed at the CAC immediate access to a medical evaluation regardless if the department qualified the exam or not. On to you, Terry. Terry, you're on mute. Thank you. In talking access to safes, a uh, big issue is the who and the where, and that's Kim Walker. Thank you. So the sexual assault forensic exam or SAFE program consists of two teams. The pediatric team primarily sees patients 11 and younger and is overseen by Anna Anton, who's currently working out of class as a nurse manager and Serena Sai, who is the Director of Primary Care Services with the Health and Hospital System. Uh, the pediatric team sees survivors at the medical clinic at the Children's Advocacy Center. They also see patients at Valley Medical Center for survivors who present after hours or those who can't be released due to medical needs. The adult adolescent team um, primarily sees patients that are 12 and older. The reason that the cutoff is here is because in California, the age of consent for sensitive services is 12 and older. This program is seen overseen by myself as the nurse manager of the SAFE program and by Andrea Berlini, who's the director of nursing for critical care and administrative services at Valley Medical Center. So the adult adolescent team sees survivors at Valley Medical Center. And since February of 2020, we also responded in the North County to Stanford Emergency Department and beginning at the end of this year, we will be responding into Gilroy South County at St. Louis Hospital. We also respond to the medical center at the Children's Advocacy Center for acute exams when needed. Next slide. Yes. I don't know, it seems to be frozen. There we go. San Jose PD process, Anjali. Yes, ma'am. The department remains in compliance of all duty manual sections and standard operating procedures related to the approval of SAFES in addition to the Santa Clara County Sexual Assault Protocol and the CAC SJPD medical team agreement. 
The duty manual and SOPs also require that all officers and detectives provide the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights trifold to all survivors of sexual assault. SCIU and the DA's office has just updated this document and it is currently being translated into three other languages, that of Spanish, Vietnamese, and Mandarin, with expected completion date of December 2021. Thank you, Terry. Oh, thank you. Authorization. This is the prickly part of uh, SAFE exams, which is authorization. So who pays for these exams? The law enforcement agencies in the county where the assault took place. That's the police agency that's responsible for payment and they're responsible for the payment of the exams they authorize. And authorization can come in different ways. The law enforcement officer usually signs the Cal OES form. There can be a separate form. Uh, a lot of times there's a telephone call where the SART nurse will explain what, what the issue is and they'll get that authorization over the phone. There is very often courtesy authorization between law enforcement agencies. So if there is a sexual assault occur occurred um, in Oakland, uh, but the victim is down here, then there will be a courtesy authorization between those law enforcement agencies. The contracts and memorandums of understandings, that is something in the law that allows us through the SART committee to make changes to ease the way and conform the way that we do things in a manner that works best for our county. So with regard to safe exams, it's important to remember that these are first a medical exam to assess for injury um, and treat medical needs, but they're also an opportunity for forensically trained healthcare professionals to collect time sensitive evidence. Both the National Protocol for Safe Exams, which was developed by the U.S. Department of Justice and Office on Violence Against Women, and the California Medical Protocol for the Examination of Sexual Assault and Child Sexual Abuse Survivors, hold that safe exams should be prioritized as emergency cases, and that the standard in California for acute exams or child abuse exams is to start them immediately or with one, within one hour of the patient's arrival. In Santa Clara, patients who are 12 and older are seen for acute exams within 10 days of assault. If there's a disclosure after that 10 day period, we can still do what is called a non-acute exam, particular for patients 12 to 17. If you ask Mary Ritter, she will tell you that it's never too late to do a non-acute exam. Um, if there, the patient may also be seen for what's called a non-investigative report this is an exam that provides survivors the option to receive a full safe exam, even if they're unsure or do not want to report to law enforcement at the time of the exam. And this is defined under the Federal Violence Against Women Act and allows patients to get the medical and forensic care and preserve potential evidence while they take time to manage the trauma of the assault before making a decision to engage with the criminal justice system. For patients 11 and younger, the acute exam is generally best done within 72 hours, although that has been a change in Santa Clara recently. If there's a disclosure after this time period, they may also have a non-acute exam as defined by the California Office of Emergency Services. And last, there's always the option of the non-evidentiary medical exam. The distinction is that this is strictly medical care without the forensic evidence collection. Some survivors arrive and they don't want to engage with the criminal justice system, but they want to know that they're medically safe and okay. For all of these exams, a mandated report is generated. And for the two that are in blue, those are the exams that do not require authorization. The patient can come in and ask for that without further authorization requirements. Law enforcement authorization uh, has an often used synonym for permission, which is permission. And that really chafes. Uh, a survivor should not have to get law enforcement approval or permission in order to have a safe. Authorization should be nothing more than a funding matter. It should be on the back end. The exam should be done 
And then it can be funneled through the correct budget. And there is really no need for survivors to hear uh, that their exam is not authorized. Exams cost money though, and as we go to cost, Kim? So we were asked to discuss costs and this slide breaks down the different types of exams that we do um, and then shows the cost associated with that. So for consultation, that is when we're called in by law enforcement to do an exam, but for some reason it doesn't occur. The patient declines um, or there's another issue that comes up, but the exam does not occur. Um, standard exam, that is generally the, the most often selected type of exam, and that's when they have a full medical evidentiary exam completed. Uh, the extensive exam is the type when somebody is inpatient. Uh, we might have to do an exam while they're in the OR, or we are in with uh, trauma, or they can't leave because of medical needs. So we'll do the exam in consultation with other providers and um, do that in the patient's setting in-house. The last type, or the fourth type of exam is the NIR, the non-investigative report under VAWA, like I explained before. That's where the patient is undecided at the time of the exam. Because that is exactly the same exam as a standard exam, the cost is exactly the same. The non-evidentiary medical exam, um, the intimate partner violence exam, and the follow-up exam for intimate partner violence are all separate. Those do not require any authorization, so those are paid separately. There is money available from California Office of Emergency Services to offset the cost of these exams. And the second column shows what the cost to law enforcement is after that offset is reimbursed. Uh, Kim makes a very good point, which is we often refer to the money available through Cal OES as a reimbursement, but they don't reimburse for the whole cost of the exams. So offset is a, a better term to use. Angelique? Yes, so when recently the Cal California Office of Emergency Services afforded law enforcement agencies the opportunity to seek reimbursement from Cal OES to offset those costs of conducting a medical evidentiary examination, Cal OES stated that they will reimburse up to $911 for a non-investigative report and up to $1,127 for survivors who have determined at the time of the evidentiary exam to report the assault to law enforcement. Cal OES does require that the cost of the evidentiary exam to be treated as a local cost and must be charged and reimbursed within 60 days for the exam to be reimbursal. Thank you. Oops. And just to add a little snippet to that, uh, you'll see the highlighted per portion says to the extent that funds are available, uh, Cal OES money is going to run out. Kim, you, you correct me if I have these numbers wrong, but the funding is for approximately 5,800 exams and statewide we expect about 11,000. Correct. Challenges on the safe exams. From the police perspective, Angelique, Yes, so law enforcement is facing six challenges in particular to the safe process. The speed of policy changes, data sharing, efficiency, limited information, access, and lack of resources. The NIR subcommittee was designed to create policies surrounding its testing to remain in compliance with the law. However, since its one year existence, compliance with the law has not been met. There are also limits to the data that is shared to SJPD. As a result, a true collaboration and feedback loop where the discussion of evidence, its relevance, the consequences and affirmative action remain unfulfilled. And due to inefficient methods of billing, 43% of invoices will not be reimbursable per Cal OES re regulations because the department is unable to receive invoices in a timely manner via encrypted email or from a portal. Information that is required per mandated reporting requirements is not provided when submitting suspicious, suspicious injury reports, leaving out required information that would include other elements of crimes that require an investigation by law enforcement. SJPD has not been provided immediate, defined as before a child leaves the hospital, 
access to children 12 to 17 years old for NIRs as required by law and the county child abuse protocol. As a result, law enforcement was unable to ensure that there is a safety plan in place for juvenile survivors of sexual assault. And lastly, the YWCA victim advocates have been amazing in providing services to survivors. However, due to the increase in referrals, there are now not enough advocates and funding to keep up with the projected increase in the next year. So from the SAFE perspective, there's been challenges as well. Um, timely notification to the SAFE teams to ensure that such services are offered within the appropriate time frame, And regardless of law, enforce law enforcement authorization that all survivors should have access and be provided with a timely medical evidentiary examination as allowed by the penal code. And no survivors should be charged for medical forensic services regardless of being authorized or not. Lindsay. Tell us about it from the survivor perspective, please. Yeah, thank you. So the perspective I'm centering today is what we hear from survivors and bear witness to as advocates in the safe process, coming forward for help during a violating experience only to feel unheard or invalidated by the system is unacceptable. Survivors should never have to worry about the cost of something that is their right. When someone's seeking support and is denied access or feels that it's too hard to receive the support, this makes people not want to come forward. You may recall the report we came to you with not too long ago with the Office of Gender-Based Violence and the SARC Committee that focused on survivor feedback. Some of what I'm mentioning here is not new. Um, it's much more detailed in that report and includes direct quotes from survivors um, within this county. To be clear, having a safe and engaging in the system isn't a desire for every survivor. This may be because a person is afraid or ashamed. They may lack resources financially or have a perception about the cost of medical care. Many people still don't know these resources exist or they simply lack trust in the system. Furthermore, language and culture continue to be barriers. The time and energy this process takes because there are so many moving parts to it is a barrier. Knowing that now, regardless of your wishes, your kid is going to be tested is a barrier. Not to mention the impact of negative or unsupportive response that you may get from a loved one when you confide in them about something like being raped. I just wanna say beyond process, we need a real culture shift where blame and shame are shifted off of survivors. And I strongly believe that that starts with prevention and community education. From the DA perspective, we want to see all survivors get a SART exam free of charge without any hassle, regardless of whether they choose to participate in the criminal justice system at that time. It is not uncommon that a survivor changes his or her mind sometime later. It could be days or weeks or months or years, and they come back to the police department and they say, hey, I'm ready now. This guy needs to be held accountable. And the law allows them to do that. And we want to assist them with that. From a prosecution perspective, we can't prosecute without evidence. And all evidence in a sexual assault is perishable. The physical evidence collected by VMC, perishable. Witness recollections obtained by the police, perishable. Survivor engagement in the process is perishable. And the timelines really matter and can make or break a prosecution. And a broken prosecution does not bring justice uh, to the survivor. And it certainly does not make our community safer. Angelie, you would go into some protocols and training from the San Jose police perspective, please. So SJPD training and adherence to these standards were implemented through various means. Beginning with the R&D unit's department-wide email with the list of duty manual updates, department members are obligated to understand the content of the policy changes and supervisors have the responsibility to ensure any new policy is understood and being implemented. Other measures included learning domains taught specifically by personnel who are assigned to the units and who investigate the cases that are being taught to ensure new police recruits are being trained efficiently. 
the Bureau of Investigations, mini academy and tenants of patrol briefings and sergeant staff are also included. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. And the review of all patrol initiated reports and when officers fail to comply with new policy changes, they and their sergeants are contacted and mentored by the prospective respective unit personnel. There's also a monthly newsletter sent out by the Sexual Assault Investigations Unit to disseminate information and in-person training for community service officers, dispatchers, and the main lobby. And lastly, detectives are also required to attend and complete child forensic interview training, which is specific to the Sexual Assault Investigations Unit and the Special Victims Unit. Filling the gaps, Lindsay. So in terms of gaps, I think we need to figure out how to provide support in the places people are already at. This isn't a new idea, right? I know Nextdoor Solutions, for instance, works hand in hand with community clinics to educate and advocate for DV survivors. Uh, YWCA has an incredible program manager that used to work in San Diego and they had advocates and there were partnerships with Planned Parenthood where they would assist with educating staff around being trauma informed and screening for abuse. Then advocates would come into support when a client disclosed and needed further help. Innovative programming like this is collaboration at the community level that could be deepened. Having advocates on site and systems like this and the new endeavor at the CAC is crucial to the timeliness and depth of support and resources on hand. This includes the availability of quality interpretation and translation. Currently, the capacity of all responding partners is a gap from what I can see. We're under-resourced and impacted by the level of trauma the community is currently experiencing. So from the SAFE perspective, the recommendations to address issues related to authorization of SAFE exams would include developing, developing and updating existing SAFE information resources for patients, SART partners, and the community in general, uh, to standardize the authorization process across all law enforcement agencies that prioritizes timely medical care, and address the SART response challenges through the SART committee, and to streamline the transfer of patients to SAFE response locations when they arrive at non-SAFE facilities. And the department recommends the following to fill in those gaps also, provide more resources and funding to agencies that provide victim advocacy services, create a more efficient way to charge for and invoice safes, improve the writing and communication of information from suspicious injury reports, and to create methods to share data from adult safe team. Lastly, the department has compiled a more robust slide deck addressing law enforcement specific answers to the safe process. Please see item L on the county page for the supplemental attachment. From the DA perspective, it is so important to safeguard the survivor's engagement in the process. By the time a survivor meets with a prosecutor, they've had a safe, they've talked with an advocate, they've been interviewed by the police many times more than once. And the court process is a long one. It can easily take two to three years, two to three years for a sexual assault case to get to trial. So justice is a marathon, not a sprint. And a rocky start can inspire withdrawal from the process. We are in development to have a victim app, something they can download uh, onto their phone, which will allow victims to access their case, access their victim advocate in the DA's office, get a hold of their assigned prosecutor. Uh, Long-term goal is to hook it up with what VMC is developing so that they can also check on the status of their SART exam or their SAFE kit. So we have a lot of uh, developments that are really going to assist victims staying engaged in the process. But what happens at the beginning is really important and immediate access, immediate access to a safe is what really matters because it's the evidence preservation that is key from a DA perspective. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to, um, thanks very much. You guys, that was very thorough and 
Um, I want to just start with one little piece of history that may be important for my colleagues, and that is that the county now invests of $2.3 million, I think annually, to support our rape crisis centers, including the funding of the advocates. The reason I raise that with all of you is that that, that um, funding responsibility actually belongs to the state of California. The state, um, I think statewide, had less than $5 million for all the rape crisis centers in the state of California. And so I know it's really appalling how I see your head. Um, it's appalling. And so we jumped in um, at the urging of um, the Y and Community Solutions to uh, invest in that. I share that because one of the things that as we look at expanded um, investment that I'll be very interested in is also recognizing that if at a local level we are taking responsibility for that uh, body of work, it would be important for us, not, not just the county, but all of the cities, uh, not just San Jose, by the way, um, but all of the cities to look at how they could contribute to the investment of building out that very robust system. Uh, the second thing I just want to acknowledge is that the, um, the county has, as you probably know, um, increased our investment in this body of work dramatically over the last four or five years. I, and with that, I, I do just want to say that I know there's an interest in us removing the issue of cost from the um, issue of concern about how somebody gets an exam. And, um, you know, I, I am uh, prepared to bring a referral back to the county to ask for more resources. That said, I would also be very interested in the kind of partnership we could um, expect from not again, not just the city of San Jose, you're here because you're our biggest and most important partner uh, from the perspective of volume. Uh, but I recognize um, Chief Nikolai that you're here also and that again, we really want all of our cities to be uh, partners here. On the funding issue, I, I do just wanna turn to Dr. Smith for a moment um, to talk a little bit about how we can remove that barrier um, sooner rather than later. Thank you, Supervisor. Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> well, I think from talking with um, the county team and the DA's office and others, um, it's become very clear that um, we really need to put uh, authorization and financing on the back burner. And from the county's perspective, you know, these are exams that really have two purposes. One is medical and the other one is evidentiary. Um, we believe strongly that anyone who be believes they've uh, been violated or any family member who has a child that's been violated should have the right to get a safe exam, no matter what uh, their connection is with uh, law enforcement. So. Uh, we would obviously like to work with the um, cities to make sure that we maximize funding being brought down from the state, but from the county perspective, um, we should do exams and figure out how we're going to get them paid for later. And what I would just say as a follow-up to that is that I, I want to really adhere to the um, the process of that SART committee. And so what I would want the SART committee to understand is um, the county's willing to step up in terms of payments so we can deal with that, that barrier, if that's a barrier. The county has already stepped up as it relates to the rape crisis centers. I think that um, the, the follow-up to that is what, what more is needed and that I do wanna engage our city partners in uh, becoming partners um, and, you know, and I recognize that everybody's budgets are different sizes, but I also recognize that we have to demonstrate that we're prioritizing um, addressing this particular crime countywide. So that's what the opportunity is, I see. So um, colleagues, are there thoughts or questions that, that others want to jump in with? And if you could use your hand, that'd be great. I can see some of you, obviously, Chair Perales, let me turn to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um and appreciate that the presentation as well. Um, in regards to, to that specific topic of funding or, or, or partial reimbursement, um, 
there was within the slide, um, and actually, you know what, let me pause for a second, just to clarify something. I know Angeli was mentioning uh, an attachment L on the, the county's agenda packet. I can't seem to access any any attachments on the county's website. I could just be totally unfamiliar with how to access that. I've, I've been accessing the ones through the, the city's um, website and, and all the attachments there. They obviously have different, um, I think, denotations is, is what they are. So I think I know which one that was. But just as a as a heads up, either maybe it's they're not there linked um, or or it's either my uh, user error, but just as a heads up in case they're not linked. Um, Madam Chair, I, pardon the interruption. This is the clerk. I can speak to that. Uh, we added the attachments as supplemental information, um, most of them within the last 24 hours or so. They are located on our web portal. Uh, on the web outline, when we published the agenda, they were not included as part of the packet because they were sent to us after publication. Okay, good. So that it, it is slightly user error, but it's also slightly harder to find. So, okay, good to know. Um, and and just so everybody's aware, it is uh, those packet or the, the entirety of the presentation is also available on the city's website. And so that's where I was accessing it. But thank you for that, um, Dave. Appreciate that. You're welcome. So going to um, the the one slide that mentioned uh, one of the, the, the challenges from the safe perspective, no survivor should be charged for medical forensic services, regardless of being authorized or not. Are we actually charging? Have we charged some of the survivors? Not for medical evidentiary exams. The medical evidentiary exam is held separately in the billing practices for the hospital, goes into a different work queue, and that work queue bills out to the law enforcement agency who authorized the exam. Or in the case of a non-investigative report, to the agency with jurisdiction. But no, those don't go to the patient. If, however, there's medical need, then there could be charges for a hospital stay or things that are outside of the medical evidentiary exam. But just here, the safe exam does not get charged to the patient. So it was listed under the challenges. That's why I, in reading it, I read it as if, is that something that is happening? It's a challenge that it is happening. Or is it is that more of just sort of a statement that hey that we want to make sure that that continues to not happen? Um, with respect to authorization, if a case is not authorized, then the medical evidentiary is, exam is not necessarily available to the patient, and then that would get charged because now it's just medical care. Okay, so it's more along the the, the lines of this: if it's not authorized, then um, that could be that could be a charge to them. Right. Okay. Okay, I appreciate the, the distinction there. And, and I appreciate Supervisor Chavez uh, pointing out that um, this is certainly something, you know, that, that I think we want, we all want to be able to resolve. Uh, the cost implications should not be something that is deterring somebody um, from wanting to get this exam. And, and so um, I think whether it is through what looks like a time limited, I was not also aware of that. So I appreciate that being in the presentation that there's sort of, we're gonna run out of Cal OES funds at some point of, of the reimbursement dollars there. Um, so we're likely going to have to come across a, 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 a solution, a different solution as well in the future. So a step in that right direction, uh, I think, is that partnership that we can have, um, as Supervisor Travis is pointing out. And so I, I, I appreciate the county um, being willing to partner in that. Um, I will I will pause uh, a second because my son just came down and handed it over to hand it back to the to the, the chair so she can see if anybody else had their hand up. Thank you. Are there any other comments for this section? I don't see any. Oh, Sylvia, there you go. Sorry, thank you. I also just wanted to um, add to uh, Chair Perales's comment. I think the. It, well, I think this will be um, discussed in a follow-up committee, um, uh, a work group. Uh, but the fact that, and Jorge is absolutely adorable and um, always captures my eyes <laughs> and my heart. Um, and I, I think the, the other piece that I heard loud and clear, and I wasn't aware of this, um, I think in, in the past, um, so I'm glad it's it's being identified now that if, um, that if, this the paperwork gets to you in terms of uh, the exams and they go beyond 60 days that um, those then um, can't be reimbursed by Cal OES and wh what is that percentage that you typically see is that 50% of what we do I, I know that you had a slide of, of it um, 
Angela, but you probably can tell me off the top of your head. No, oh, absolutely, council member. Thank you very much for the question. So to answer your question, uh, it's 43% of invoices that will not be reimbursable. 43% that will not be reimbursable. Oh, okay. So I, yeah, there's, there's some work to do around that. Um, and uh, I'm so glad to hear you. Um, Supervisor Chavez, you've just been such a leader in this and you never hesitate and you bring in um, to, to pitch in and make sure that we address all these gaps. And so I'm so glad to see um, the, the willingness to, to, to put your, your stake in the ground around this. And, um, and I think Jeff Smith, I think he's still on the line. Thank you so much for that support. I appreciate it. I hope that we can also reciprocate in the same way. Um, as you know, our budgets are somewhat different, but I think it's something that I hope that um, our chief is also uh, very much supportive and on board. And so um, we, we will follow up with that as well. Thank you, council member. Kim? Um, I just wanted to clarify the reimbursement issue. Um, there is no invoice that's required from the hospital in order to be reimbursed by Cal OES. The only thing that the law enforcement needs to submit is the 960 form from Cal OES, which is the invoice for reimbursement. And the only thing that you need to have on that form is the case number, the date of the exam, and the contact law enforcement officer. We spoke to the chair for the division of the victim services at Cal OES and she confirmed that the bar is very low. No invoice is required from the hospital. So if there's any delay, it's just a submission delay. There's no reason for it to be um, requiring something from the hospital to send in. Thank you, Kim. And I might have misspoke. I, I classified it as an invoice because I don't know what else to call it. Um, but, but thank you for that. I don't know if maybe it's the reporting um, of those incidents. And, you know, we can, and maybe uh, Lieutenant Jimenez or Angeli can, can talk to that. Is what it, so we can just really pin it and move forward. Yeah, I think I'll let the Chief Washburn talk. It's good to see everybody. Thanks for having us. Um, oh, but there you are. We're hearing a, a different story about how reimbursement does, and I appreciate Kim reaching out. That's information we didn't know prior to this meeting, but our internal staff and fiscal don't, um, aren't allowed to pay or ask for reimbursement on an invoice that's not paid. It's not part of the practice in accounting, and it's not something that they're comfortable with. So they're also reaching out to Cal OES to try to figure out a solution for this, but uh, it is a challenge and we are trying to get to the bottom of it. I don't know if you have anything to add, uh, DC Washburn. No, not at all. Um, I think you kind of summarized that. And, and I just, I wanted to offer um, uh, just kind of the perspective of law enforcement and I'll, I'll be very brief, you know, and, and I know I spoke with Chief Mata about this and uh, Lieutenant Jimenez and really the San Jose Police Department. And I think it's important um, that this is stated and, and I'm, I forgive me, I'm Elle Washburn. I am the Bureau Chief of Investigations. Um, the San Jose Police Department is absolutely open to, uh, to policy change, right? So at present, certainly we follow the county protocol. We um, have even, uh, you know, we have our own SOPs um, insofar as reinforcing those county policies. But at the same time, we are open to positive change. And I, I would like to say that that is illustrated by our participation in the CAC leadership group in um, expanding the um, pediatric exams that we do qualify. So that's a, a perfect example. And, and I agree with you, uh, Supervisor Chavez, that the SART committee is really the vehicle for that thoughtful change. You know, we absolutely believe in the value of the SART committee. And that is, uh, you know, team building and collaboration for positive outcomes for survivors. Um, and, you know, we, we're certainly one of the larger organizations here, uh, but we're one of 24 members that sit on that committee. And in the spirit of collaboration, when we do sit down and address our challenges, you know, my hope is also that we um, discuss together, you know, what those solutions might look like um, so we can, you know, resolve the gaps and provide better services to our community and our survivors. And a perfect example of that, you know, where it's how can we help is what we've highlighted today as it relates to, you know, the advocates um, and, and offering them additional support because an increase in, you know, authorizations or qualifications, whatever terminology you use is also going to um, 
put it increased demand on community solutions and YWCA. So I just wanted to put that out there that we're absolutely open to dialogue and having a thoughtful change and also having the systems in place that could support um, those, those policy changes. So that's it, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Deputy Chief. Uh, Raul or Jorge, I don't know who raised his hand. Yeah, that, that was me. Um, I was looking over the um, the Cal OES reimbursement form, so thank you for uh, that's that's been in the attachments as well. Um, and there was one question because it states in here complete all sections of the form submit to Cal OES within six months of medical evidentiary examination. I know we've been using the 60 days. What is the am I just reading something wrong there? Am I interpreting something uh, incorrectly on the, the time frame? Kim, do you want to give feedback to that? Uh, no, that is the form that they are to fill out for law enforcement to get the offset reimbursement. And that is um, entirely the instructions that are on that is what's needed to follow. So I, the 60 days, I guess, is an internal function of the San Jose finance. So that is news to me, but the six months um, and no invoice from the hospital is, is clearly evident on the invoice reimbursement on that form. Maybe uh, DC Washburn, can you speak to the 60 days or, or can somebody speak to the, the sort of the discrepancy there of the 60 days and the six months? I will also defer to Lieutenant Jimenez. I'm, I am trying to find, I know it's um, codified somewhere. Yeah, thanks Chief. I'm trying to find it, thank you. And, and uh, Council Member Perales, so the way we read the form is that this is the interpretation of our fiscal unit because we want to get the right answer, right? I think everybody's trying to get the right answer. And fiscal reads that as is that we have to have received the bill and paid the bill within 60 days. And then we have six months to get reimbursement. So that's that's their interpretation. They're also reaching out to Cal OES, but um, I talked to them as late as last night and that continues to be their interpretation of how the, uh, the process should work. And if you read the Cal OES forms, you're gonna see both. You'll see 60 days and you'll see six months. So. Um, that's kind of where, where we're at in the interpretation process. I hope that's kind of clear, but obviously this is not a really clear subject right now. I also remember a paralysis. One thing I, I might recommend is that, um, that since all of this is going to go back to the SART committee, um, with the report back and, um, and I'm, and I'm just going to try to wrap us up because we have another, um, one more big chunky subject to, to discuss. But um, what I'm gonna recommend is that the SART committee also involve the finance folks, both from the healthcare system on our end and your administrative system would be my recommendation to have, to kind of wrestle this topic to the ground. I think the most important thing that I, I wanna put a marker down on today is that we are not, that we are removing any barrier for service period that authorization that this is what I want the SART committee to come back with is that authorization from a, for, from a finance perspective is not a barrier to anybody getting services period that the county um, will take a look at what role we need to play in terms of um, fairly compensating you know so we're minimizing risk for the cities and at the same time I'm going to say this is not a a solely city responsibility in the sense that we are all about public safety. So I also want to look at cost sharing there. Um, and then third, and this is also really critical, is that the, um, well, there's a fourth too, but the third is that I'll ask our staff um, to, uh, I'll come right to you, Jeff. Um, I, I'll ask our staff to um, also uh, take a look at something else we've been working on, which is not making um, the fear of a medical bill a barrier for somebody because somebody may not even understand this crazy authorization process which we need to eliminate but be fearful that by going to the hospital there's a bill that'll get sent home or there and right now we don't do that but they're or they're going to get a significant bill and what i worry about is women particularly who've had um or victims who have had uh, strangulation or other things where, where they've lost air that we're not getting to those exams fast enough because people are worried about the resources. So from my perspective, that's a bigger issue that I'm gonna ask the SART committee to prioritize after fixing this authorization issue. Um, and then finally, I, I do really wanna emphasize that the, um, the point that, um, 
that Deputy Chief Washburn just raised about um, getting around that table and fixing problems so that from a cultural perspective, our departments are working well together. Our medical department and our police department and the folks on the line are not having conflict because of paperwork. That is really bad. And from a cultural perspective, I just have to say this out loud, that making it appear that we have a challenge with our are mostly male officers determining whether or not female, mostly female victims have access to healthcare, even if that's a perception or access to services or access to an exam is just something I want to, I want to address today. Like I, that, that we just, we need to eliminate that because again, culturally, we want our teams really being on the same page because these are such difficult cases. Um, and, and, you know, frankly, from my perspective, the law enforcement component and the advocate component, they're, they're really figuring out how to work together. So our institutions need to be able to do the same thing. So that's where I'm hoping we're gonna get. That's the direction I'll reiterate at, at when we take action. Dr. Smith? Um, I was pretty much gonna say uh, the same policy issue that you just talked about, but offer an opportunity for the SAFE committee to consider something uh, that would accomplish that. Uh, we really need, as was mentioned earlier by Kim, to find a way to standardize the authorization process throughout the county. And that means that we need to have some centralized authority to authorize the exam to be considered for partial reimbursement by the state. Um, so it strikes me that we could enter into an agreement with the cities um, to allow the DA's office or the sheriff's office to authorize 100% of the uh, evidentiary exams. And we could then take the responsibility centrally to try to get the reimbursement from the state as part of the local contribution, we could, as part of that contract, just figure out a way to appropriately um, bill uh, the cities for their part. Um, we do this with a lot of other centralized uh, police enforcement information, such as CJIC and other things, um, but it would be very desirable, I think, for us to be able to say to the SART teams, <clears throat> um, anytime anybody needs an exam, they're authorized and we'll figure out the money later. Thank you. And we'll put that back to the SART committee. Thanks, Dr. Smith. That's that's good thinking. Um, Councilmember Perales or Chair Perales and then uh, uh, Councilmember Adanas. Did you have anything else you want to add? Uh, yeah, no, thanks. I, I agree with the, you know, I think the invitation of our financial or fiscal teams on either side, because it sounds like there's, there, there could be um, part of the, the confusion is lying there. Um, but I would agree with uh, Dr. Smith's last statement there that we should just be able to make that definitive statement and then figure out on on the back end how we're going to actually cover the cost for this. The, the last thing, which I think and we'll also save it maybe for a a recommendation we come forward, which was the re the, the uh, challenge of being or not having enough victim advocates. That also sounds like that's a funding um, you know challenge that we need to be able to just uh, add enough uh, to the pool there. Um, and I think that should be something that we we want to ensure happens. That was it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I think that's a really good point. That's a really good point. Sylvia, did you want to add anything else? Yeah, just lastly, I just wanted to um, talk about what you um, said in terms of culturally and what um, the perception that, you know, it, is, it isn't true, um, but some people could perceive it that way that uh, a man is uh, authorizing or not an exam. And so I think that if the SART committee can also discuss what, what you know, there's policies that we have and and then there is the practice that that takes place out in the field. And so I'm hoping that we can also take a look at 
what are um, survivors being told in terms of an exam? Are they, you know, is that information shared with them? Hey, listen, I'm going to come back because I have to go go get this authorization to make sure that you have this exam or they just kind of do this without letting them know. And then that way um, that person doesn't feel that uh, control over them in terms of, of the examination. So I think that's another um, aspect of this art um, that can be discussed within the SART committee and in, in terms of what is the practice and um, and how we share that information and it's trauma informed. Absolutely. And Lin Lindsay, I know, keeps us on that. So we'll make sure that we, we stay focused on that as well. All right, um, colleagues, we're going to move to item 2B. This is another uh, very uh, robust discussion, and I know we have a lot of presenters. Um, this presentation should be about 20 minutes. I'm going to ask the crew to look at your 20-minute clock because I, I do think this is going to have a lot of discussion um, to it, too. And for 2B, I think, let me just get to my, my paperwork here. I think I am turning this over to Dan a little. Um, so I think, so this is our a presentation from uh, the Department of Children's and Family Services. Um, and then the San Jose Police Department, the County Office of Education and Allen Rock School District relating to reporting of child abuse by schools. And I'm gonna hand it over to Dan to get us started. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors and council members. Daniel Little, uh, Director of the Department of Family Children's Services. So I'm gonna share my screen and go over a, a quick presentation on uh, reporting child abuse. So hopefully that's still showing. Yeah, we got gotcha. you. Thank you. So uh, guidelines, and this some of this has been covered, so this will be just kind of reinforcement. Um, involuntary sexual activity is always reportable. Um, Incest is, is reportable even if voluntary. Um, voluntary sexual activity may or may not be reportable and that's where we'll go into some of the, um, some of the specifics. And I included this in the packet, but due to time, I'm not gonna go over the, the, all the details of this. Just know that there are specific requirements on what's a mandatory report and what's not. Um, based on situations and specifically around age of the victim and age of the alleged perpetrator. So again, I'm not going to go through all of this. It's in the packet, um, but just know that there are some differences depending on ages. And then for mandatory report, the, the kind of blanket who should report really includes school personnel, uh, child care providers, medical professionals, mental and social health, law enforcement, clergy, then volunteers can fall under that category. And the, the role of a mandatory reporter is to clarify, not to investigate. Um, what we don't want to ask is for people who are listed as mandated reporters to feel like they need to investigate the uh, facts behind um, what, they're, what they're observing. Um, the role of a mandated reporter is really just to, to observe if they feel like there's, there's um, something reportable and then to make the call. Um, and then that follows to um, either the Department of Family and Children Services um, and or law enforcement to complete that investigation. And then for anybody to report child abuse and neglect, um, there's really two avenues. There's 911 for, for the law enforcement, um, and then there's the Santa Clara County Child Abuse and Neglect Center, or the, our, our Child Abuse Hotline. Either one of those options are, are viable for reporting, and, and when, if needed, um, we do cross-report between, between law enforcement and child welfare. Um, if there's a need to coordinate a, uh, an investigation. I've included in here a, a quick example of what our actual hotline tool looks like. So these are the questions that the, the child uh, abuse screeners at our uh, hotline are going to be asking. So, um, you know, you can see that there's very specific uh, information asked about um, what the allegation is, physical abuse, is it um, including siblings, and the hotline screeners are then going to use this tool to go into a child abuse and neglect decision tree to determine our response timeframes. And again, I'll leave this in the packet, but I won't cover it today. Um, but you can, there's just a decision tree that guides um, our responses. So this goes into the response. So the, the three different types of responses we can do are a joint response, 
So this is where we're gonna be responding with law enforcement. This is our uh, most expedited response. So DFCS social worker would need to respond within 60 minutes of receiving that call. And that's where we're gonna show on site with, uh, with the officer um, to complete that kind of joint engagement with that family. I've included a link in here because Santa Clara County actually has a law enforcement protocol posted on the DA site um, that goes through the different components for law enforcement as well as for um, Department of Family and Children Services for many different scenarios, including um, sexual abuse allegations. The other, the second kind of response that DFCS can have is what's called an immediate response. So this is from two hours and then the state allows up to 24 hours to respond. I think from an uh, operational perspective, we do not wait 24 hours if we don't need to wait 24 hours. Our um, expectation is that we're responding by while somebody's on shift by the end of their shift. Um, the 24 hours is just what the state allows to a maximum for a response for an immediate response. Immediate response really indicates that there is a um, potentially an active safety threat um, that we really need to respond, which is why we want to respond as quickly as we can. The third type of response that we're allowed to do is a 10 day. So a, a 10 day would be the state gives up to 10 days to respond. This is going to be when there's no immediate risk to the health or well being. So oftentimes this is a, a historical report. Um, so something that's happened in the past, or there's been a change in scenario so that we know the screener knows that the child is, is safe today, um, but we're still going to be able to respond. And again, just because we get 10 days doesn't mean we're waiting to the 10th day to make contact. It's just the state allows up to 10 days to, to make that initial contact. The last kind is really an information only or no response. So this information only could be people calling to ask for questions, um, people asking for resources, um, or if there's been uh, no allegation of a child abuse and neglect. Um, in the past, we really didn't have a mechanism to, to uh, respond to these um, appropriately. There wasn't really a way to connect families to resources. I'm happy to report that we've recently started a pilot with uh, First Five called Neighbor to Neighbor. And what that's doing is for these non-reports or information only when there's a resource need, we can actually then connect that family to their local family resource center so that FRC can start reaching out and engaging with that family. Um, we have one pilot site at the um, AACSA Family Resource Center. Um, that as that pilot gets going, we're hoping to expand into many more family resource centers. Then this is information I received from our Child Advocacy Center that uh, very exciting that, that they opened uh, this year. So the, the CAC provides the California Forensic Interview Training or the CFIT and Minimal, minimal Fact Interviewing Training. DFCS also has a staff member stationed at the CAC who has completed the CFIT training and they act as a liaison between the CAC, law enforcement and uh, DFCS. And then any law enforcement agency conducting interviews at the CAC, including and DFCS staff will be required to complete the CFIT to actually conduct those interviews. The, the CAC's goals, it was explained to me, is to get to where we have all youth zero to 17 and any adults with developmental delays who have experienced sexual abuse or assault will have their forensic interview completed by a certified forensic interviewer at the Child Advocacy Center. The CAC plans to host another CFIT training in the spring of 20, 2022, um, as well as a minimal fact interviewing training, both for law enforcement as well as for DFCS. And then I've included just some national training resources that, that we've used and our, our, some of our partners have used. Um, specifically around child abuse, around trauma response, um, and around um, responding to children who have experienced sexual abuse. And then some, also some local trainings as well. Um, the, the, the first one here is nice because it, it's, um, it's free and it has modules that are set up not only for general, but as specific for like child welfare, schools, law enforcement. Um, Seneca also has an online training that's available for um, people that are providing direct care. Um, and again, a pretty expansive modules. And then the, the Greater Bay Area Child Abuse Prevention Council Coalition also has a number of online resources. And then I've included an overview of, of what the trainings that the DFCS staff go through. 
um, just to get a, uh, an experience of what our staff have to go have to uh, get trained on before they're doing their field work. So again, a number of trainings around sexual abuse and maltreatment, um, interviewing, uh, trauma, and then CSEC. And then our, our staff all have to do ongoing training. So there's a CSEC training that we have to do um, annually. We had a contract with Aaliyah Trauma, uh, Aaliyah to do trauma competencies. And we actually partnered with uh, Santa Clara County Office of Education to provide this to schools as well. And then in development, we're looking at a um, beginning this fall, a responding to sexual abuse specific training that's gonna be an ongoing series for our staff. So that's all I have, I think, for, for my areas. I believe we're gonna go directly to Dr. Dewan and then take questions at the end. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so I'm going to speak specifically about the mandated uh, reporter role of school personnel. Uh, next slide. Uh, cases of sexual abuse may be suspected in children and youth, and as such, the laws in California strive to ensure that all school personnel are trained to detect abuse and to know their duty under the law. Next slide. Schools are required to verify that all employees receive annual training, that they fully complete that training. And as employees are, are hired throughout the school year, they are also required to complete the training. So within the first six weeks of every school year, all personnel uh, receive training. And then anyone newly hired receives training within first, the first six weeks of them beginning their employment. Next slide. And there are severe penalties um, for mandated report reporters who fail to report. Um, as was mentioned earlier, the duty is to report, not to investigate. And generally, um, the school personnel, the mandated reporters are informed that the investigators assigned to the case may contact them for additional information and conduct an interview but it is important that they themselves not attempt to do any investigation. Next slide. Um, one of the distinctions I think is really important to understand is that mandated reporters must report both suspected or known child abuse or neglect. And often uh, in young children and uh, school age children in particular, there are varying um, ways in which a person may come to suspect child abuse. Sometimes there are symptoms that show up at school. Uh, sometimes there are not. And sometimes children do report things that are happening uh, to a trusted adult, and sometimes they do not. Um, so it is often very difficult to, um, to identify cases of suspected um, abuse, but these trainings help all mandated reporters understand what to look for and to help them navigate um, making the report. Mandated reporters, um, in addition to making the call, must complete a form uh, that is uh, then utilized to help support the investigation. Next slide. Another important consideration for everyone to be aware of is that the mandated reporter duty is an individual duty of that person. So the duty to ensure that the report is actually made rests with the individual reporter, um, which in some cases may mean that more than one person at the school site uh, may make a report because um, each person who suspects or knows has a duty to report. Next slide. I wanted to share just a few trends and patterns that, that we've been observing. So before COVID-19, it was generally well understood in our schools that abuse, um, and in particular sexual abuse, was often um, occurring with children by persons known to the student. And that reports and referrals may have been caught earlier. Uh, we may have been able to um, observe changes in students' behavior or patterns of their, their conduct and they had easier access to school personnel and had trusted relationships with persons. Um, during the campus closures, we did observe decreases in calls and reports um, that were being made. Uh, we suspect that some of those decreases were due to lack of access to mandated reporters, that many of the typical uh, signs of abuse that might be observed 
in person were not observed well in virtual uh, learning settings and that uh, families and children themselves may have been able to uh, keep more of those types of activities hidden from their classmates and their uh, school personnel. And there was just limited access. Um, and so part of our observation is that the cases that, that were made and re reported tended to appear to be more severe. Uh, we do not yet have data released, but we also observed anecdotally that there was an increase in online uh, predatory activity and grooming activity, including uh, trafficking. And with the return to in-person instruction, which occurred for many students last spring and fully for all this fall, we are seeing um, observations in children's behavior and some concerns that appear to be trauma related and schools are wrestling with that assessment and understanding um, how much of what they're observing could be related to the COVID-19 trauma and just general uh, trauma and returning to in-person activities and things of that nature versus potential um, abuse that children may have suffered during the campus closures. Thank you. I think we have two more presenters um, on this. I think someone from San Jose and then um, Alum Rock School District. Yes, that is correct. Um, my, I'm next. My name is Angeli Montessa, the Crime and Intelligence Analyst for the San Jose Police Department. Thank you for having me today. The following report is the San Jose Police Department Sexual Assaults Investigations Unit report regarding the sexual assault forensic or the response protocol for child abuse sexual cases. And with me today, as well as Captain Brian Matchett of the School Liaison Unit and Lieutenant Jaime Jimenez of the Sexual Investigations Unit. In order to understand also mandated reporting requirements, uh, we must also understand the two penal codes as it relates. Penal code 11166 requires the mandated reporter to make an initial report as soon as possible and to send a report follow-up within 36 hours. And for penal code 11165.9, I know Mr. Little did touch on this in his presentation, but to reiterate, this penal code does require that reports of suspected child abuse or neglect may be made to either to law enforcement or the County Welfare Department, also known as DFCS, or the Department of Family and Children's Services in our county. So what does that response protocol look like? Should a mandated reporter choose to report to DFCS, DFCS will need to fall forward the report to law enforcement for further investigation. And as you can see here on slide three, this causes a delay by the added step of DFCS who needs to forward the report if it does not involve an alleged in-home abuse or person of trust. And any other reports that are forwarded to law enforcement this extra step to review and determine whether or not DFCS will investigate the case causes a delay for any other reports outside of DFCS's scope. So however, should the mandated reporter report directly to law enforcement, law enforcement can then begin that investigation right away and conduct an interview at the Child Advocacy Center as soon as possible when appropriate. The following here shows some very generalized data with regards to child abuse related offenses. I just want to clarify that this is not specific to reports made by schools, but this just gives you a high level view of cases involving specifically 288A and 647.6A1. And note that the cases for reports made 15 days or more after the incident occurred remains pretty consistent over the last several years, pre and post 2020 specifically. Slide four here also talks about some trends that we are seeing as it relates to schools. The main trends that we have observed specifically at schools are parents are calling the police to report the incident after the school, the student arrives home. Medical staff is calling police when students are seeking medical treatment for their injuries after the fact. And schools are contacting district offices for guidance prior to or in place of contacting law enforcement after learning of an incident. As a result, there are just some concerns that the department has and 
he, that includes the lack of awareness and education among school administrators of identifying a crime and reporting versus the handling of cases administratively. And a lack of communication between schools and parents after incidents occurring on campus and parents are providing that delayed reporting. However, there are currently existing options and alternatives that have been in place pre-pandemic. SJPD officers can be employed with the districts on school grounds and administrators can take accountability for following mandated reporting laws and requirements through continued education and communication between SJPD and school administrators. And of course, should any gaps or questions arise with next steps of mandating reporting laws, school administrators should always seek the advice and consultation of their legal advisors to maintain such accountability. Slide seven is a list of de the department's prevention and education strategies. Currently, in my role as a crime and intelligence analyst, I provide data informed targeted strategies for, our, for prevention and education to our crime prevention unit, who then offers a number of presentations and classes to our schools and the community. This includes C2 and healthy relationships. Also our Internet Crimes Against Children unit also teaches the Vigilant Parent Initiative Program, which is a proactive hands-on learning type of class for parents to learn how to navigate social media in order to keep their children safe online. And lastly, the YWCA does have a clinical counseling program that helps to provide great counseling to reduce re-traumatization and to reduce the offending and or reoffending of crimes. The department also proposes that an informational pamphlet be distributed to school administrators, educating them on the mandated reporting laws. And this could be hand distributed via the school liaison unit. In closing, thank you for your time. And I hand it over to the Alum Rocks Union School District. Thank you so much. Corina Herrera Loera here, uh, board president for the Alum Rock Union Elementary School District, uh, but most importantly, mother to a beautiful 12 year old Citlali. As we all know, uh, schools oftentimes become the first point of our children making uh, any reports of sexual abuse, especially. Unfortunately, there have been times where our children have had to wait after they decided to report because they reported right before shift change. And so we know that oftentimes when they are reporting, they feel scared, not knowing what's gonna happen when they get home. And the more, they, the more they're waiting, um, the more they're just uh, not knowing what's gonna happen in their lives. And so I'm glad that we're having this conversation here today. Um, I'm excited to hear you know, things like uh, Lieutenant Jaime Jimenez say, I didn't know about this. That is where the magic happens. And so I'm happy to be a part of this um, together, finding opportunities to improve each and every one of our systems, um, learning from one another to better serve our children and everyone in our community. Today we have had uh, prayers answered and I wholeheartedly believe that this is how we save lives. Um, with us here today, we also have Dr. Aimee Almasan, Director of Social Emotional Learning, who will be available for any questions. And I'm gonna turn it over right now to Dr. Anya Artigas, our Coordinator of Mental Wellness uh, Support, who will uh, go over some information. Thank you so much, Board President Herrera uh, Loera. Uh, again, my name is Anya Artigas, and I'm the coordinator of Mental Wellness Support Services at Allen Rock School District. So we wanted to just talk a little bit about what it looks like for us in terms of who mandated reporters are on, on our school sites and even within our district office. And so, uh, you know, if you look around, what you're going to see is that everybody within our school district, whether they're at the district office, you know, as a bus driver or somebody from our child nutrition services, department or a health aid um, through to our school sites everybody is trained yearly at the beginning of the school year right before the, the students arrive they're you know trained yearly if they're new and there's also the the yearly refresher that's given and so everyone at the school is a mandated reporter uh, go ahead and next slide please and so the way that this normally works for us as mandated reporters is that uh, as Dr. Dewan uh, uh, shared earlier um, if we observe or there's a suspicion or knowledge of past abuse, um, the mandated reporter is mandated to um, talk with the child and gather more information in order to file the report. And so um, there are different types of reporting that we would do. So there's 
physical abuse, some uh, sexual domestic violence, bodily injury, and then the CPS report is uh, done via phone call and the written report within 24 to 36 hours. Um, if it's if it's immediate, if it's if it's imminent danger, and on behalf of the child, which is the left hand side, uh, that report is done immediately. It's done as soon as the student is out of earshot. Um, we make the phone call to uh, Child Protective Services to file the report uh, because a lot of times when that happens, we're running up against a clock and we're trying to maintain the child in our space to ensure their safety. So that report is filed right away. Uh, for non-physical abuse, uh, neglect, emotional, uh, emotional abuse, or historical abuse that is no longer happening and the child is not in imminent danger, uh, we are, you know, we ask all of our mandated reporters to make the report within the next one to two hours. Um, and if they are needing uh, release in order to be able to do that, administrators and school counselors are aware um, that they do release the teacher or the other person to make the report. Go ahead and switch to the next slide, please. And then I wanted to talk a little, about, a little bit about our current trends. So much like what Dr. Dewan was speaking to earlier before COVID-19, you know, our patterns of reporting um, in terms of child abuse and domestic violence, there was steady, steady reporting throughout the year uh, with concentrated reporting in our 95122, 95116, and 95127 zip codes. Um, and what we found during shelter in place was that there was an exponential decrease in reporting for us because children didn't have access to safe spaces. They couldn't have confidential conversations with us in which they would disclose. And so oftentimes what was happening was a child would wait until they were able to use the chat to let us know that they needed help in some way, shape or form. But again, there was an exponential decrease during shelter in place. And then upon returning to campus, uh, there's been an exponential increase from August 17th, which was our first day of school to August 31st. There was very little disclosure um, in terms of students because they were adjusting to being back on campus and really kind of connecting with the, the staff at the school. But from September 1st to October 31st, we've seen an exponential increase in the reporting um, because the kids are starting to feel more connected and there's feelings of safety and trust that are being built with the children and the adults. Um, we did do, I did work with our school counselors across the district to begin to get a sense of what it really looks like. And much like in years past, there is a concentrated uh, amount of reporting around domestic violence as well as sexual abuse that is coming out of the 95122 and 95116 area. So this would include um, all the schools uh, within uh, the Fisher area and all of the schools within the, the Madsen area. So that's King and Story areas concentrated on both ends. Um, and so again, uh, the, the numbers are the highest in those two areas. There are, uh, there is an increase in the, what we would call the George area. So that would be the 95127 closest to our district office. So there has been an increase in domestic violence reports this year in comparison to years past. Um, and also the one last thing I wanted to highlight you know, the growing concern for us as a district is that because the, because our students were um, sheltering in place and unable to access the supports, now that they're coming back to us on the campuses, there is, uh, there's been an exponential increase in the amount of crisis that we're having to field every day. And this is, it's running from the elementary schools through to the middle schools. Uh, in total, uh, we've had, uh, a little over 30 uh, students who have had suicidal ideation. We've had close to 40 students that have reported different types of self-harm. And we've had to hospitalize six students just within um, September to October. Um, and again, kids are still adjusting. They're not uh, fully connected to school as of yet. The concern is what it's gonna look like in the months to come as they get more adjusted and they uh, have to take time to be at home again, um, especially in December. Um, Thank you. Thank you all for that presentation. Um, I'm just gonna do a time check with my colleagues. I know I lose most of you at noon. We're gonna take about um, 15 minutes to give um, comment and questions. Then I'm gonna go to public comment. 
I apologize to, to Carla and Julie. I don't think we're gonna get to your great presentation. I know it's in the packet, but I wanna make sure we can take a public comment um, on this item and then public comment for the whole meeting. So with that, thank you all for this presentation. I'll go to my colleagues to see if there are any comments or questions. And I'll start with council member at NS. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm, you know, this is a, this is something that I've heard since last year, anecdotally, um, when we uh, got our sexual assault um, service providers in this uh, city, together with our chief, um, at that point, it was still Chief uh, Garcia. And they anecdotally told us that the violence was increasing. Um, and the child abuse that they were seeing was more severe. And so this just really lines up with what we're seeing, where it lines up with what we know, where people are really struggling. Um, uh, I'll share that my own daughter had a incident with her, her friend. It, these are first graders. Um, it, somebody pushed her off the monkey bars. And when she got pushed off, somebody started kicking and hitting her in the head. It, it's it's and it's crazy, these are just little first graders. So I can see that there's a lot of need for, for our, our children. And so thank you so much for sharing that. I'm really interested in learning more about the 95122, 95127. Um, it, it breaks my heart to hear that many children um, with suicide ideations. Um, and so it sounds like we really need to respond. And so one of the questions I have, and I realize we have like this thinnest staff police, uh, force of the nation. You have all heard this, we know, but yet our police department does great and wonderful things each and every day. Knowing what we know right now, um, and either uh, Deputy Chief at, uh, Washburn or, or Chief Mata, how can we, kn knowing you know the urgency of, of some of these incidents and the timing that just comes into play, is there any strategy that we can use right now? I know we already have a protocol that's you know tried and true, but is there anything that we can do to make sure um, that the children aren't waiting and that that um, you know that they're safe? Those safety concerns that were brought up by Dr. Artiga and Dr. Almasan are are reduced. Can we? Can we? What can we do about this? Well, I can uh, start and then um, probably allow Captain Brian Matchett, who's on the line from the school liaison unit, because I know he worked um, to offer some of the recommendations there. Um, but first and foremost, I mean, certainly supporting the police department so that we can then supplant um, officers in patrol to reduce our response times, which we recognize um, are not always being able to respond as quickly as, as we would like. Um, you know, that said, some of the recommendations in the presentation related to um, education through our crime prevention unit, so supporting those types of um, professional staff at the police department, and also what the school liaison unit uh, can offer in the form of outreach and education. And I don't know if uh, Captain Matchett may want to offer some of his uh, unit's expertise as it relates to, you know, what more can be done, um, maybe on a day-to-day -day basis or through the the resources at the school liaison unit. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Chief. You, you hit the nail on the head. Really, it comes down to education and training and uh, contact us. Uh, you know, much of the presentations on Saturday uh, weighed heavily on abuse and neglect that takes place outside of the school. Uh, what was left out is what occurs uh, during school days and during school hours. So we gotta be cognizant that uh, uh, what we believe to be child abuse and what we define as child abuse also encompasses uh, the significant fights and uh, incidents that occur on campus. And, um, you know, we are your police department. Uh, we really need to hear from those mandated reporters uh, immediately. Uh, and we've seen those trends where um, the, uh, the, the schoolyard um, personnel uh, on through to the administrators uh, just don't you know connect those types of dots. So uh, anything that is outside of what's um, called a mutual affray, which is where um, two individuals choose to fight each other, is a crime, and uh, right. we need to be notified uh, of that. Thank, Thank you, you, Captain. And um, I'm going to get there in just a minute, but I want to uh, close the loop on this item in terms of I, I know there's a lot of um, 
priority one calls that come into our line and 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 those that are not priority one and so it really just stretches our officers what do we do in the meantime this is what i'm taught um, what i'm referring to in terms of a strategy so that it you know those priority ones aren't competing with our children um, because if i understand it correctly these calls are kind of it, they're not priority ones so they go into this queue um and so it, it it leaves our children kind of in the in the wind, if you will. It, you know, one of the things that I, we are doing presently is the supervisors and the area commanders provide oversight. Certainly, while officers are responding to those priority calls for service, the supervisors are uh, triaging, managing those pending calls, calling back reporting parties, providing necessary updates as it relates to available resources, um, and we really put an emphasis. Uh, now more than ever on providing customer service, right? Because we don't want that to be a gap. We don't want to lose the kids. Um, mm -hmm. if, if that's the world you know we're living in right now, depending on the day of the week and the time of day with, with calls and, and available resources, then we need to make sure that we are reaching out and you know, our supervisors are held accountable to do just that, as well as our, our area commanders. And this is something that I certainly can bring back to mm -hmm. the table with our uh, deputy chief of the Bureau of Field Operations, Stan McFadden, to, um, to kind of shore that up. Right, it, it, listen, I'm, I'm gonna get to that other um, physical um, piece because I hear it loud and clear, that's that's a mismatch there. We need to make sure that we correct it. Um, uh, and I, I apologize, I took my um, video off because um, my internet is shaky, it was saying. So I'm just gonna, before I freeze completely, I'm just gonna turn it off. <laughs> Okay, so so I would um, like to hear if maybe what we could do is offline in the same um, spirit that we have this SART committee that discusses some of these issues and works those kind of those kinks out. Could we do the same thing um, and have a joint response for child and um, which is fit also including physical and, and sexual abuse reports with maybe just our Alum Rock School District to begin with a little pilot program so we can figure out an alternative um, to just having them go into the queue. I hear um, Captain uh, Matchett that you know relationships are really important, and, and education and training is is um, a you know absolutely on the top need. Um, but there's also um, you know the, the timing and, and making sure our children don't don't wait. Um, and so, is that something that we could get going? Um, any of the chiefs that are on, on online today? Well, I could speak on behalf, uh, you know, and, and certainly Chief Mata is, is on the line. I mean, it, addressing a multidisciplinary approach to how we might close that gap and reduce, you know, the times, I think probably our, our partners in the county and specifically the school district might have some good ideas around that. I know mm -hmm. the police department's always open to, you know, how we can serve our survivors mm -hmm. and community better mm -hmm. um, and, and having a vehicle for that discussion, I, I think is a good idea. And I think we can certainly have a seat at that table. Wonderful. I hope Dr. Artigas and Alma San, um, we can get on board with this. And Dr. Dewan, I heard the same thing from you in terms of trends, of recognizing trends um, in, in the severity of, of some of this abuse. And so um, I'm not, you know, I don't want to leave any anyone out. Um, I want us to make sure that we support all of our communities. And so hopefully what we could do is, is take this offline, get to the nitty gritty, figure out um, also why we are, um, and on the, on the school side, why we're not calling some of these fights in and some of this, um, uh, what we, what I think our police officers would consider assaults. Um, and so I think that's also important to identify before it, you know, that kind of violence grows into something else and um, weapons are brought into the picture. And so um, I would love to bring in both of these things um, into a kind of a committee that we could follow up. So th those are my questions. I, I actually, I lie. I have much more questions and comments, but I'm I'm uh, very aware that I'm taking a lot of time. And so I, lastly, I just want to uh, thank all of you for your dedication to our community. Um, yesterday, I had the privilege of 
of touring the sexual assault investigations unit, the special victims unit, the family violence unit. And these um, folks are just a group of people who are so dedicated um, and um, the, the fault is never in our in our in our people who are who are there um, given it they're all um, it's our systems that have gaps and every so often we need to tune them up just like we tune up a car or any any other system and so um, I I will make a motion um, uh, but before I do I would like to hear um, other concerns thank you thank you um, chairperson Perales. Yeah, thank you. And I saw Councilmember Carrasco had her hand up. I don't know if she was having connection issues either, um, but just wanted to make sure if she uh, wanted to chime in that she had an opportunity to. Um, but uh, just wanted to, and I know we're we're running out of time here. Um, so I just wanted to highlight one point that was um, brought up within the, the PD presentation. And this is only because I have personal experience with it, which is being a school resource officer. I was a school resource officer for uh, six years and the number one report uh, that I took while on campus was related to sexual assault or abuse. And, uh, and it was frequent, which was uh, obviously very concerning, but it was strictly based on the relationships that I was able to build with the students on campus. And I know that uh, that was suggested in one of the alternatives, obviously, um, a bigger discussion at hand, right, that, that our school boards have had um, this past year in regards to whether or not um, police officers should be on campus and what their role should be. But I do think that uh, whether it's officers on campus or not, I do think that this is a, a reality of a challenge that, um, that should uh, have been expected and, and one that now I think that we're seeing in regards to the delay uh, at times because an officer um, being called in to respond to uh, a campus report like this, coming from, from off campus um, and having responsibilities, uh, other responsibilities is, is going to be delayed regardless. And hopefully it's not to the, to the extent that we've seen where um, they're extremely delayed, say because of shift change, right? Um, that's a major concern. And if it's not gonna be an officer on campus, I do think that, that we wanna try to find how we can resolve that and, um, and I know, and I was talking to Supervisor Chavez uh, previously about an effort that I think the PD was working on to try and identify, you know, maybe an officer or identify a resource to, to see if we couldn't respond sooner. I do think that this is a reality, though, that, that we should be looking at whether it is that solution. It's bringing back the conversation of how we can, um, can have officers on campus to be able to, to manage uh, reports like this, build that rapport with, with students. Um, wanted to just share that perspective and um, I'll defer to, to comments from my colleagues um, as well. Thanks. Thanks, Raul. Uh, Susan? Thanks. Um, I realize there's not time for, for sufficient time for conversation on these huge issues, but I just want to share the uh, some of the impressions that I have uh, gained in listening to all of this. Um, First is, is sort of fundamentally why police and not therapists are responding to uh, kids in crisis, you know, for a suicidal ideation. Um, I just think intuitively would, would best be met by a, a clinical uh, specialist rather than uh, law enforcement. I'm also really concerned as we talk about trying to intervene earlier, redirect kids, provide preventative services that were sort of continuing this model of um, police intervention. And I'm thinking specifically about fights with kids that, that was mentioned. I, I think the, the sexual assault and abuse um, to me is more clearly um, uh, perhaps a law enforcement response, but I still hope that we're looking really at the whole paradigm and what kind of institutional structures we want to use to intervene in uh, in cases of crisis. And if anyone has additional thoughts on that, I'd be really glad to hear them. Thank you. And um, I wanted to see if, if uh, Councilmember um, Carrasco, if, if you wanted to just weigh in, if you're able to um, 
I, I will say she sent me a text saying she knows that, that we're running against time and she wants to talk about mental health. And so um, for young people, here's a, a, a recommendation that I want to make because I think this is such an important topic. And I do think um, in the San Jose uh, Police Department's presentation that the, the, the the merger of the um, issues relative to what's happening on campus, I, I do think they need to be decoupled. I appreciate, uh, you know, Angela, you only have so much information that you can dig down into. So what I would like to recommend is that the, um, that the, our Department of Children's Family Seniors, I mean, our Department of uh, Children's Services under Dan Little's leadership, along with, um, Dr. Duwan and perhaps um, Dr. Duwan, you all can think just a little bit and uh, Dan, think a little bit about how you want to shape this table with PD and other partners, um, is that I do think we need to have a conversation more robustly around the, um, the reporting for um, child sexual abuse and child abuse at home and or at on a school campus. But um, that, that reporting process, we do have a really distinct protocol, but I think that the issue here is um, the issue that um, that uh, Council Member Arenas raised. I think when Sylvia was talking about the timing issues, I think we're in a very good place to start having discussions about timely response for both um, our, ch our, uh, our social work side and the police side. And I know this partnership is really delicate um, uh, Deputy Washburn and uh, Chief Mata, like I know that it's a really important partnership between the social work team and the police team on these issues. Um, but I do think we need to take a look at um, the, the response times and the like. That said, I also feel like this is such a newer, a newer topic and somewhat, you know, we, we have the benefit of that SART committee that's been working together for a while and we can send that stuff back to the SART committee. I'm not sure we have an easy um, location to send this. And I know that Sylvia has really wanted us to put together some sort of a working group that can dive more deeply into these issues. What I would like to request, um, only because I don't want to start a new committee without having a conversation with the, the leadership at the, um, uh, Dan, your leadership, Marianne, your leadership, but also the Child Advocacy Center, because it's such an important component of the response. What I'd like to do is ask the, the Child Advocacy Center leadership, which includes our victim witness um, team and the district attorney's office and our nonprofit partners to at least have a review of what was presented today to nail down kind of the top three or four things we'd like to work on together and have a report back that comes both to the Children's Family Seniors Committee and to the Public Safety and Justice Committee of the city. Um, at, at a future time, I think we need to come back uh, together and, and review that. But I think at least to get started on what Sylvia is asking about relative to refining the, um, the timelines and processes and procedures. There are other issues that are broader that um, I wanna make sure that we can address, but I think we should actually start there because the response time and the our response capacity right now is really the, the most important thing I think we need to deal with relative to children coming back to school and the timing of that. Um, is, is that all right generally as a way to go for my colleagues? Was that clear enough? Yes, no. You, you want this discussion to first go through, I'm sorry, I didn't even raise my hand. What, what I would, that's okay. What I'm suggesting <laughs> is that- To the safety leadership, right? What I want to use is the child advocacy leadership that's already in place right. to review the gaps and the concerns that were raised today to shape those discussions relative to urgent response times now, and then have that discussion come back both to the Children's Family Seniors Committee and to um, you all so that that the, the city can take a look at the, the policing side. We can dive a little bit more into the social services side. And then when we reconvene as a joint committee, we'll be able to hear it collectively. That is what my request would be because at the Child Advocacy Center, all the partners are there, public safety, the, um, the nonprofits, you know, we have our, our whole team embedded there, including our Department of Children's Family Services. So that is my, that is what I would like to recommend. Happy to get feedback. If that's not 
if anybody wants to give feedback to that, I'm happy to hear it. Magdalena, we'll start with you. Yeah, Supervisor, thank you. And uh, thank you, Council Member, for bringing us together. It's uh, undoubtedly a, an important conversation to be had. I'll tell you, uh, hearing this conversation, and, I, and I, I've had a difficult time uh, getting in uh, and, and weighing in because I've had a horrible connection. <clears throat> I've been uh, kicked out several times uh, during this uh, the last couple of hours. Uh, but uh, it's, it, it's been heartbreaking to see and hear the data uh, and around the mental health issues uh, in particular for such young children. Uh, and, and, and I'll tell you, as a mother of three uh, young teenagers uh, who have been dealing with the pandemic, uh, some of the issues that I've been dealing with as a single mother, uh, I can only imagine, I, I, I'm a I'm a well-resourced mom, by the way, uh, and and the issues that I've had to deal with through the mental health system uh, have uh, have uh, I, I I'm not going to get into it. So I can only imagine the moms in in my community what they've had to deal with, uh, or or better yet, the children who don't know how to ask for what they need or or can identify what they need. And so I'm wondering. Uh, supervisor if this is also the place um, where the organizations can also address some of those mental health conversations and how we can uh, support our families how we can support those parents who don't yet know how to support their children or who are asking for those questions i'm really just trying to to understand the trauma that's uh, about to be uncovered. I think we're just scratching the surface as children are coming back into school. And, and we know this, we, we've known this even just when we look at children who are coming back from summer vacation or from holiday. And so now these are kiddos that are coming back from 18 months of not being in the public eye and having to deal with untold stress. The untold trauma, I think, is going to be a tsunami. Uh, and, and what we're seeing is just the, the tip of that iceberg. So I, you know, I, I, I am a-okay with uh, your suggestions. And I'm wondering if this is also where we can have the conversations around mental health services, yeah. increased uh, community uh, conversations, but not just to support the children, uh, to support those, uh, those uh, uh, mamas and those daddies that can provide those services also at home and support for those parents who don't know what to do or what's happening in their homes. Yeah, and Magdalena, I think we're, the, the board actually, our committee is having a special meeting in December that's taking a deeper dive into the mental health services and absenteeism and other things that we can engage um, you in right away. So that's great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Juwan and then Aaron, you're gonna have the last word. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Chavez, I just wanted to um, affirm our support for your motion. And, you know, yes, um, we would be happy to uh, work on this initiative and this project and solution seeking together. I did need clarification that this would be decoupling the issue that was raised about potential uh, role of school police um, or police on school campuses and that that's specific component. This is more about the uh, protocols around mandated reporters and the sexual abuse protocols. Yes, I mean, that, that's what my request is gonna be as it relates to the Child Advocacy Center group. Now, the outcomes of those discussions, you, you know, may branch into some recommendations that you wanna make at a later point in time. Uh, but right now, I'm, I'm really more focused on us being able to respond to child abuse on and reporting um, and I and folks, the reason I'm narrowing it down, what my experience has been that while everything is connected and it truly is, that's been my my lifelong experience. You pick up, you know, pick something up from one part of the table, it's got an impact on the other part of the table. But in order to really address and refine um, and make policy changes, I'm trying to scope this down as tightly as I can so that we can start to see improvements and then move on as we are able to uh, to do so. So that that would be my recommendation. Aaron? So let me say I'm grateful for the conversation, and I think it's a good conversation to have. I do think that we need to be cautious 
about ways in which we're pulling um, families into the system so that we intend to be supportive, but frequently are seen as punitive. Erin, we're having a super hard time hearing you. Try turning the video off. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So I just want to say I'm grateful for the conversation, but I do think that we need to be very aware of the fact that as we pull families into systems that we see as being supportive, are frequently seen as the families that are pulled in as being punitive. The reality oh. is that. Erin, I lost, I, I'm so sorry. It sounds like what you're saying is really important and I can't totally hear you. I know Adriana and I are leaning in high to hear you. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know quite what to do about it. So um, if you can just stay really close to your mic and finish that thought. Okay, then I think we just need to be very aware that, that these, who gets pulled into these systems more often than not is people of color, and they're very nervous about the interactions with these systems. And, and the idea that, I, and I appreciate um, Councilmember Perales' comments, but the idea that we would have law enforcement on a campus to act as a social worker instead of having someone who is trained to be a social worker doing that sort of thing. And frankly, I would say not a system involved social worker. That, that we need people in there who families trust and see as supportive and who are trained, frankly, to help out with the mental health piece as well. So I just think we need to be very cautious in how we do this. And I apologize for that Thanks, Erin. Corina, then you have the last word. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna um, wrap us up. I just wanna mention that, unfortunately, Alam Rock were not a part of the uh, Child Advocacy um, Leadership Group. I confirmed with Dr. Almasan and Dr. Artiga. And so, you know, the numbers that were shared today are actual numbers that we're dealing with well, you now. Know, we can include you in that. I don't, I think there's no problem. Okay. I would love yeah. to, you know, because we need to make it happen. Our children are, I would hate for one of those sticks, right, to like follow through today or tomorrow. So we need to get on this now. So thank you so much. Yeah, of course. I think that makes a lot of sense to have a, a few representatives from some of the school districts. And Dr. Dewan can choose another one in addition to Alam Rock. Um, we're now going to go to public comment on this item, and I apologize, each public speaker will get one minute, and then I'm going to come back for, um, for action from, the, 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 uh, from both boards. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. One moment while we get the timer set for one minute, please. First speaker is Paul Soto. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, good good uh, morning. Um, I'm requesting if one additional minute to speak of this topic. I've been a, a victim of sexual assault as a result of the tax base that was generated in the city through the porn industry in the 1970s. So I'm asking for one additional minute. Uh, chair? All right, Paul. Um, chair? Paul, if you could just go ahead and um, speak, and then if you need more time, we'll we'll uh, go from there. Okay. Okay. Well, this, this was the request that you're getting yeah, because there's Paul, only can two you, minutes. Okay. Hold on. Can you start his time over and then go ahead, Paul? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. So it's two minutes. Okay. Um, I think we have to start. What I found that was explicitly neglected is class. The Audrey Potts case illustrated clearly how class money affects truth. Those two boys, those, there was three of them, three youngsters that did all those things to Audrey Potts. Audrey Potts went home and hung herself. Those three kids, you know how much time they did in juvenile hall? 30 days for what they did to her. The De Anza case, 17 guys gang raped a girl inside the room. Her homegirl saw it through the door. They went and they grabbed her. Dolores Carr, no charges on any of them. Presentation High School, when Sam Licardo was the was the, was the head of the sex crimes unit. All those girls had reported at presentation, but it wasn't prosecuted. 20 years later, they come out. So class has a very significant role in these conversations as to how we define what truth is and whether or not people can exercise power. See, I came... Next speaker is Irvish. I'm unmuting you. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Oh, Irvish has dropped off. Next speaker is Raina. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Oh, it looks like we may have lost. Hold on one moment, please. 
Uh, Irvish, there you are. Um, okay, you have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you very much to the entire commission, board of supervisors, and the uh, chairperson and the respective the members. I want to talk about the what we are living in the world of a foolproof law system where we wanted to make every move perfect with the intelligence, with the prevention, with the counseling, and the commission and the programs and being implemented in the county. But what are the critical points that we are trying to address? The law applicability and the people playing around with it, where the law is not applicable or there is a lawless system. And second, there is a law applicability, law applicability, but still there are violations happening advertently and inadvertently. There's a still lack of education about between the children, school, between the school children about that, what, what exactly the abuse is about and how they are being actually being abused. And then there is a level of a community and a society where actually the it's abuse is happening hours. and the community is deprived of what the education resources are available, though the intelligence programs are being implemented in the county. We really need to address those things at the critical points. And that's what we're going to go back to Raina. Raina, you have, oh, goodness. Uh, Wait, looks like we have, have one minute, Dave. I'm sorry? Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay. I, um, give me just one moment, please. We had a misclick here. We're going to put Raina back on the attendee list. All right, while she is moving to the attendee list, I am going to unmute Erica Elliott. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Morning, my name is Eric Elliott from Community Solutions, and I'd like to raise the, the need for an increased access to specialized behavioral health services that focus on gender-based violence. Our rape crisis advocates provide a bridge of peer counseling and supportive services, while we help survivors and their families address safety, support, and their basic needs, and much more. As survivors transition from crisis to stabilization, it's important that we connect them to therapy services to begin their long-term healing journeys. What we see is uh, county behavioral health resources are limited to individuals with access to Medi-Cal, this excludes survivors without legal status, individuals that may not be able to afford private therapy, kids that do not have access to it or they don't meet the extremely low eligibility income for Medi-Cal, or even survivors that have private therapy but that don't get adequate access to consistent services by their providers. For community solutions, our solutions to violence division, we have a one and one fourth full-time therapist. And last year we served a total of 272 sexual assault survivors and their families. And we we're only able to provide 24 individuals specialized therapy services. We need to look at the increased access to specialized behavioral health services that focuses. We're going to go back to Raina. You'll have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good to know that school personnel are trained to identify signs of abuse in children. Can we institute a training program for parents to recognize such signs as well? Sometimes in my culture, kids are too ashamed to talk to their parents. Uh, thank you. Next speaker is Perla Flores. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. First, I want to thank Supervisor Chavez and Councilmember Rennes for your continued commitment to ensuring a continuum of culturally responsive policies, services, and support to survivors of gender-based violence. And we're particularly grateful for your efforts to surface and advance survivors' rights. We have several opportunities to do so to advance best practices related to survivor rights and ensure high-quality services by implementing policy recommendations that have come up and and several reports, including those identified through the CEDAW Task Force and Victim Rights Advocacy Project. And we look forward to partnering with the county, city, and other commissions and collaboratives and key stakeholders towards developing an implementation plan that ensures the identified policies and recommendations are operationalized and institutionalized. And thank you again for everything you do to support survivors. Next speaker is Sharon Danoa. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm Sharon Deneau with the South Bay Coalition and Human Trafficking. I'm here just to ask the county and city to consider fostering opportunities for multidisciplinary collaboration on the issue of sexual assault and dedicating funding for that coordination. We know survivors present with a number of intersecting challenges and vulnerabilities, including a number of legal needs from family law, immigration, identity theft, uh, victim rights. And this really requires that proactive collaboration that uh, coordination can assist with to help ensure we avoid re-traumatization and foster partnerships. Thank you for your time and consideration. Next speaker is Kimberly Gutierrez. You have one minute, please go ahead. 
Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kim Gutierrez, Anti-Human Trafficking Services Program Manager at Community Solutions. First, I want to thank all the committee members and today's speakers for your continued dedication in addressing support services for survivors of gender-based violence and taking an intersectional and collaborative approach to serving survivors. The victim service providers of the South Bay Coalition and Human Trafficking created an intersectional screening tool to identify and support clients who have potentially experienced one or more forms of gender-based violence. In utilizing this tool, we found that 12% of human trafficking survivors also experienced intimate partner violence, and 18% had experienced sexual assault. Uh, we also create a condensed version of this tool so our housing partners can screen and connect potential survivors to a confidential advocate. This ensures multiple pathways for survivors to, uh, to access comprehensive and long-term case management advocacy services with a confidential victim service provider. Thank you again for your commitment to Going back to Paul Soto, you have one minute. Please go ahead. Paul? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, the power dynamic has to be discussed because Martin Seligman uh, did a lot of study around learned helplessness. Now, redlining, what that creates in the mind of the child, see, because uh, Lee Matson was used as an example here. That's where the crimes were committed against my parents. They beat my parents. Are you listening? They beat them. They beat Mexican out of them. I don't speak Spanish as a result of it. I have never seen Alamoc or Eastside School District publicly atone and reckon with that past. And because they have not, how is it that you are going to try to rectify these problems when at its very root, we have not the humility nor the courage to confront that truth? I think that, that right there, once you get at that, then you're going to have your solutions. But we can't get there, can we? Because power automatically means resources. And the subjugated, we don't have that power. I get a minute here at these meetings, and that's it. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you. I'm going to go to um, Councilmember Perales um, for your for the city's uh, motion, and then uh, Susan, I'll get a second. Aro, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm deferring to Councilmember Arenas, who I believe had a motion. Tito. Oh, great. Sylvia. And Sylvia, do you want to? Yeah. I'm yeah. Happy so, to sorry, go I couldn't. I could. I couldn't. Uh, sorry, technical issues. I think um, my motion um, has found a solution um, based on your suggestion. So I think that that works for me, and I think it works for our school districts. So. I'd love for our the school districts that have been most impacted by COVID and um, by sexual assault be invited to the CAC leadership um, council meetings. Um, and I'd also like to um, direct our city manager uh, to follow up on um, a implementation plan um, uh, along with our sexual, uh, our gender-based um, work plan that we've been working on as a result of some of these joint meetings. Um, and uh, Supervisor, I, I'd love to see if we could have this on our next agenda in terms of having a work, a, a collaborative work plan that um, people can see um, overall the work that has been done and the uh, the complementing work that, that we've uh, uh, achieved so far with everybody's work and where we're headed next. Um, so, uh, I'd like to just direct the city manager to follow up on a joint special meeting of gender-based violence and sexual child sexual abuse and gender in the gender-based violence response and strategy work plan and the PISFIS committee um, in the uh, January through June 2022 work plan. Um, and this is really just technical so we can get meetings going without having to submit memos. Thank you. So we have a motion there. Uh, do we have a second? And I want to second. Okay, we have a, a second. Uh, I thought I heard Vice Mayor Jones maybe uh, jump in, uh, but yes. we'll give it to. Okay, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll give it to you then. And uh, and so the fr <laughs> friendly amendment uh, is is going to be uh, in regards to reporting back uh, additionally on um the the efforts and hopefully solutions that we'll find on that um the reimbursement um for the start exams and then 
Uh, I know it wasn't discussed, but I know it was within the PD presentation on uh, the non-investigative reports, and there seems to be some discrepancy on the mandated reporting requirements. There were 41 of the 47 NIRs that were reported as not having satisfied mandated reporting requirements. I I'd like to try to get to the bottom of that and find out if we can come to an agreement on what those, you know, what are the bare minimum mandated reporting requirements, even for the NIRs. And so uh, as we're going off and trying to find a solution for uh, the funding reimbursement, I would like to also find uh, a solution for that. Uh, so if I can just ask that we include that into the motion, um, and then uh, we get an update within our PISFIS committee uh, before we we come back to a joint committee here, if you can include that in your motion, Councilman. Absolutely, and do you want that to go through the SART um, subcommittee? Yes. Wonderful, accepted. And is that okay with the seconder? Yes, it is. Okay, great, thank you. So we have our motion um, and then I'll uh, defer to you if you wanna get a motion and then we can take votes, uh, Supervisor. Oh, that's okay. If you guys wanna take a vote on yours and then we'll do okay. ours right after. We'll do that. Then I'll ask our uh, clerk if we can do a roll call vote, please. Corrales? Yes. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Cadenas? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very okay, much. Motion passes with all members present. Thanks. Thanks, Raul. And thank you to all the council members and to the staff. Um, I'm going to make a motion that for item 2B and 2C and that we're going to defer, I'm sorry, for 2A and 2B and that we'll defer 2C till our, our next uh, uh, board meeting, I mean, our next committee meeting. And that is re to refer to the SART committee, um, the resources necessary to address all um, safe exams to include financial personnel as appropriate from both or all agencies that may be impacted, to have a report back to Children's Family Seniors in the uh, in January on where we are in that process. And as part of that, to discuss resource investment strategies that are inclusive of all cities. And that we also consider not just the initial exams needed for um, safe, but also the um, treatment so that we can make sure that people come uh, that they're not um, not coming because they're fearful of, of paying for treatment. And that for item 2B, that the work discussed to better refine the mandated reporting, the training, and the response times for all parties that include the social services agency and our police agencies be referred to the Child Advocacy Center's working group and that that include a discussion and an understanding of mandated reporting actually for both the SART and the CAC committees. And that that shapes the conversation that comes back um, and that it'll come back to the Children's Family Seniors Committee prior to a joint meeting. And that we invite in December to our special meeting relative to mental health for, um, um, for young people we, that we send an invitation to this committee so that anybody who would like to join us is able to attend. And that would be my motion. Well, I'm, I'm glad to second it. I want to um, ask for a, an additional piece for your consideration where we're talking about funding responses. Uh, I want that the consideration to include funding for positions for therapists as well as opportunities um, through workforce development pipeline to become social workers and therapists. I think that would be great. And Supervisor Allenberg, I'd also like to include that for our discussion in December. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so with that robust debate, can we um, do our roll? Vice Chairperson Allenberg. Yes. And Chairperson Chavez. Yes, okay, Thank you. unanimous, surprise. All right, with that, um, we have one more um, body of work ahead of us, and that is to hear from public comment. And uh, we'll do that jointly for both parties, and then we will wrap up our meeting. And this is to speak to an item that is not on our, either of our agendas, but within the purview of either of our committees, and that each speaker will get one minute. Next speaker is Irvish. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Irvish, are you there? Again, yeah. Again, thank you, very much. thank you very much to all the Board of Supervisors, as well as the respective chairperson and the commissioners and their council members. Uh, again, you know, wanted to emphasize on uh, that what as a part of a commission that, you know, what we are addressing, there are 
there are developing communities. However, there are deprived communities as well. Where we are implementing the program, we are developing the government to address the issues. We, we have the law enforcement agencies to report the right set of resources for that. However, still, there are people out there, there are language barriers out there, there are, there are, there are, there are abuses that is happening, which is preventing the social, uh, social injustice and not allowing them to say the things that they need to do and doing the things that which they wanted to do within the society. So I wanted to make sure that you know those barriers are also being addressed with the communities, with the migrants, non-immigrants. They're also being addressed within the commission's jurisdiction as well. Thank you very much. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you. I, I want to say thank you and, and apologize to our op, uh, our Office of Gender-Based Violence that we're going to make sure you're the beginning report when we when we convene. And I want to thank you all very very much for attending to the robust discussion and. Um, all of you uh, for your time and attention uh, to, to all of these matters. So thank you all very much. Have a good rest, safe rest of your day. And um, we'll look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks all. Thanks Raul. And Sylvia, well done. Yes, thank you. Recording stopped. Thank you.